citizens to be heard. We, uh, Ali Matinari is going to speak. Uh, we'll do that first. As a reminder, uh, when you, uh, if you uh, want to get in the queue uh, in the discussion, please enter your name in the chat. I'll keep a running uh, list here. And uh, also, if you would, when you're speaking, uh, please turn on your video so we can see you as well as hear you if you have it available. Um, I am not sure exactly uh, how we're, Adrian, I, I don't know how you're going to get uh, Alan in here. I uh, don't see him on the. Yes, sir, I can unmute him. Are we uh, ready for input? Well, I think that's the first thing unless there's something I have missed in this process. If not, let's go ahead and uh, let's ha have Alan uh, make his statement. Yes, sir. Uh, Alan Montemayor, uh, you will now be unmuted to provide input. Continue to speak with you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm Alan Montemayor. Many of you know me. I'm the uh, chairman of the Alamo Group of the Sierra Club. We have about 3,000 members here in the San Antonio area, and our main task is to uh, uh, tr request sustainable energy and water policy from the city of San Antonio, from SAWS, CPS Energy, and City Council, and other entities in San Antonio. You've been given a very difficult task to look at the generation uh, mix that CPS Energy has and make recommendations about the future of that mix. We recognize this is a very complex um, uh, uh, task, and there are many competing priorities uh, that you have to deal with. Uh, there's, there's certainly cost, affordability, reliability, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. So I, I admire you guys for taking on that task uh, and just wanted to give some brief input uh, to that. Um, being the Sierra Club, obviously we are lobbying for renewables uh, uh, in this mix. Um, and it's not just renewables, it's renewables and batteries as well. And I know that there are uh, obstacles to this, there's cost obstacles and availability, et cetera. But from a, the big picture, from a climate change perspective, we really owe it to San Antonio to seriously consider and move forward as quickly as we can on renewables, uh, not just from a climate change perspective, but from an ozone perspective, an air toxic per perspective, um, and a particulate um, perspective. The citizens of San Antonio really need this. Um, they need your reasoned guidance to move CPS forward uh, towards renewables and batteries. Um, and, and not just uh, C CPS can't do this alone. Um, they can't do it all. Uh, for, there's cost limitations and affordability limitations. So I'm asking when you make your recommendations to CPS Energy, encourage them to bring in businesses, private citizens, organizations, and other entities that can push renewables forward in San Antonio. Um, I have solar panels on my home only 10 panels, but I'm already generating more power than I'm consuming from CPS Energy and powering two electric vehicles to boot. Uh, I've been doing that for three years. It is doable. And with your guidance, I think CPS Energy can do a lot more of it. Um, I do thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And um, I wish you the best of luck in pulling this all together uh, into a cohesive package. Thanks again. Bye. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your uh, your input, and uh, uh, so uh, thank you for participating. But we will um, now. Uh, I'm opening it up uh, for any uh, opening statements that uh, Burns and McDonald might have, or CPS might have, and then we'll start in with the queue. And if uh, if there are any uh, opening statements. From either one of those parties, please let me know by turning on your video and speaking. Okay, guess that didn't get anything. Let's start with the queue. Who would like to ask a question, make a comment, start a discussion?
Okay, um, uh, not seeing anyone, hearing anyone, I um, assume we can adjourn. Anybody? Somebody else just came in. Um, oh, Alan said he forgot to add, they need to get rid of cold as quick as possible. Okay. Now, okay, go ahead, Peter, you're on. Yes, thank you, Reed. Um, had a question kind of following back up on our conversation from this morning. I just wanted to get a clarification on the extreme weather uh, sensitivity and uh, the way that it, it reads as far as how it's gonna be uh, run. And it's gonna run for a full year and it's, it's only gonna run on the, re the reference scenario. Is that correct? Uh, don't know that we have anybody on here on the call unless they're with uh, Ann from CPS that wants to address that. Well, maybe Knight from CRA can address Knight. Uh, oh, okay. Have... Knight, uh, you're on. Uh, so I think. Turn you, your uh, video on, please. No, so that's. That's right. So uh, we are running uh, that sensitivity uh, for one year in 2030 in the reference scenario across the nine portfolios. And in that year 2030, we have um, you know, an event that looks like winter URI. So essentially, you know, what would happen if some uh, a similar event happened in 2030, given the resource mix in that year? And we also have an extreme heat event as well. Um, being basically high uh, temperature leading to higher AC demand um, for two months period uh, in July and August. Does that answer your question? So, so is so it is only for the reference scenario. That's right. Okay, and I guess my my question is, and I don't know if you you would speak to this, uh, Burns and McDonald, or if it's a CPS uh, representative. On the um, on the individual scenarios and the um, the sensitivities and how they're impacted, on there's a, as an example the net zero uh, scenario, how that would be different from a reference scenario or a volatile market scenario. Wouldn't we see different outcomes in respect to the extremities and what would actually be available in those scenarios, as far as what what the best course of action would be. So uh, this is the Bashish from Burns and Mac. Uh, from my understanding, uh, you know, uh, each of those uh, scenarios are different, uh, assumes different uh, combination of assumptions for different variables outside of the portfolios, uh, not related to the uh, to the CPS energy portfolio. So there is a combination of high gas prices, or maybe you know, gas prices are different. Uh, carbon uh, assumptions are different, capital cost assumptions are different. So depending upon how the scenario is defined, uh, the combination of various inputs, right, uh, that went into the reference case have been altered. And I think there was uh, one of the uh, slides in the last presentation that talked about how those combinations were uh, set up uh, for those different uh, scenarios. And keeping those assumptions the same, all nine scenario, all nine portfolios for those scenarios would be run, and you can see the combination of how those portfolios behave and how those portfolios change in as a result of the change in the these underlying scenario, the underlying you know external assumptions that would affect the uh, results. So that the the idea of doing those. Uh, scenarios is to see how robust or how the portfolios uh, uh, that CPS Energy has developed would react or you know would perform in those extreme uh, in those conditions which are different from these reference scenario cases. So, so the sensitivity wouldn't be different under a different scenario. It wouldn't have provided different outcome to that particular portfolio. That's my. That's what I'm trying to understand. If there's no value in running a volatile, a volatile market on a weather, extreme weather. 
So again, uh, I haven't seen uh, the sensitivity results, and again, okay, so uh, the there uh, you know the, there are things that can be done, right? So when you have a portfolio under the reference case and under any particular scenario, and you're doing sensitivities on those scenario, you you know typically we you know we, we can see that the portfolio, the expansion plan, or the combination of resources are kept same, and then uh, because of this change in the assumptions in those sensitivity cases we want to see how robust that is or what's the delta how things are changing so that you make an informed decision as to how risky or how you know reliable that portfolio is so that's the intent of doing those sensitivity analyses to see how you know by varying certain senses certain variables how that particular portfolio would behave okay, so the outcome of the portfolio in terms of the resources being selected will not change if you are doing a sensitivity analysis. And uh, Knight, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's the approach you are going to take for the sensitivities? Knight. Yeah, that, that's right, this is Pat Augustine. Um, I see. I'm sorry, I'm on my phone. I don't have my camera active right at the moment, but I think that's that's yeah. broadly right, uh, Debatius, and, and just to answer right. the question, it's a, it's a good question, Peter. Um, you know, across the four different scenarios, I do think it is fair to say that you'd have slightly different impacts from the extreme weather sensitivity because the different scenarios have different gas prices, they might have a different carbon price, they might have different resources in the ERCOT market, so the wider ERCOT market could be influenced a little bit differently. But I think the idea here is that we think we'll get a good robust view by just focusing on the reference case because this extreme weather event is really pushing the envelope on load and uh, plant outages and wind and solar availability. Uh, that is really overwhelming some of the other factors such as gas price or carbon price that would be coming through the scenario. So, your point is fair, but I think the approach here is to just stress test the one scenario because we think we'll get most of the answer that we need. And just to reemphasize what Knight said, we're going to be evaluating all nine CPS portfolios against that sensitivity, but under the reference um, core inputs. Thanks, thanks for that, Pat and Knight. Uh, and and my, my basis was our conversation, and of course, which is, an, which is an important one about reliability. And this morning we had a real robust conversation about that and being able to be uh, as sure as we can whenever we do get the results back that it was a thorough uh, modeling of that particular event and that's, that's why I'm, I'm raising it so that there's no questions on the back end that could we have done a more thorough uh, modeling of that particular impact so thanks for that feedback and um, just consider that as you're going forward with um, the reviewing of Thanks. CRA okay thank you, thank you Peter Let, let's let's see if this kind of helps a little bit Peter Pat, when y'all are doing the sensitivity uh, on the uh, on the reference case, which we have, we obviously haven't seen, what are what are you stressing? Are you stressing uh, demand? Are you stressing uh, availability of capacity? What what are you what what knobs are you turning to replicate? Because we had we had two. We had two problems, at least maybe three or four, but let's just say the top three problems we had was, was increased uh, fuel cost or unavailability of fuel. We had increased demand and we had reduced availability of capacity. Are you moving all of those knobs or what are you doing to simulate what, um, what are you doing to simulate uh, that stress on, on those nine portfolios yes yes we are moving all of those knobs and all those variables uh, so at both the ERCOT level and the cps energy level uh, so we're running the ERCOT wide simulation with higher load based on storm eri data and based on uh, the heat wave of 2011 i believe as a, an impact on how that could be hitting uh, ERCOT wide load and CPS energy load. So higher demand as a result of these extreme weather events based on historical observations. Uh, secondly, natural gas prices uh, reflecting what we saw happen in the winter in Storm Uri where 
demand for gas uh, and unavailability of gas can push prices very high. And then thirdly, availability of the resources themselves. Uh, so that's primarily a winter thing, not as much a summer impact, uh, but we've taken a look at what happened in or during Storm Uri and derated solar and wind based on weather behavior, as well as fossil and nuclear type uh, capacity based on what happened. I'll caveat that by saying we've also looked at Senate Bill 3 and the type of weatherization initiatives that are going forward uh, at the ERCOT level, at the CPS energy level, and are making some adjustments. Uh, so we're not assuming it's as bad as it was because there's a lot of um, activities that are happening to uh, weatherize and prevent some of those really severe outcomes. But based on some of the ERCOT reports, we still have a lot of data on the availability of resources. So it's those three variables, demand, um, gas prices, and availability of all resource types. We're simulating the ERCOT market, and then we're gonna get the resulting ERCOT power prices, and then we simulate the CPS portfolios as if, as we've created them and make the adjustments to the different resource availabilities against the higher demand and the higher gas prices and then take a look at the costs and the market exposure. So we'll also be recording, you know, how much more reliant are you on market purchases in portfolio one, P1 versus P6, for example. And that will kind of populate the scorecard. I know in the November RAC meeting, we'll have a bunch of slides and discussion on that, but that, that's the approach that we're moving forward with. Okay, and so beyond those three that, that I mentioned you just discussed, uh, on the one on availability of capacity or resource, however you want to say it, will we be looking at that on the basis of what, for example, you're going to get uh, some X percent reduction in wind and solar? Are you going to also make assumptions about uh, equipment failures or anything inside the system itself uh, at CPS? Or are you going to assume that that all runs? Or are you going to assume it that it ran? The way it ran there. How, what are you going to? Are you going to? Or make any assumptions about it? I don't know. Yeah, we're going to use some data from the ERCOT postmortem report primarily on Storm Uri. So, uh, for CPS energy resources, uh, wind and solar, we're going to base on you know the weather data and how that impacts the plants, and then at a high level, gas capacity is going to be derated or put in an outage of about 7% or so, 7 to 10%. That reflects what has happened, adjusted for the type of weatherization initiatives that the market and CPS Energy is taking. So there'll be certain things that might be unavoidable. There may be fuel unavailability or um, an outage that happens, but things that are weather related where weatherization initiatives uh, can fix it, we're going to try to incorporate that. So it's not as severe as what happened two years ago or two winters ago, because we're assuming there has been some adjustment, but we're still going to have material D rates to those availabilities to reflect that an extreme weather event, a gas shortage event can still happen. But you're not going to assume uh, equipment failures uh, like we had. Not as extreme, not, you know, the full okay, plan going fine. out. Just, yeah. Just trying to get an idea. We, we, we still have, and I think this is a lot of Peter's concern and questions. We, we still have a lot of concern about, you know, the individual scenarios. Uh, and, um, while we've had a lot of discussion on them, for example, uh, Pat, there's still, a, I'm getting questions from people about in these scenarios if you take the the one that we've received some information on which is the uh, base case or um it says ERCOT business as usual pretty much just the way they were but on any of these are you making any different assumptions about ERCOT in the other uh three scenarios in other words are you looking for ERCOT to move to a more of a capacity market or not move, or are you, you know, you making any assumptions? I mean, the scenarios to me are really sensitivity analysis on on each one of the 
uh, on each one of the portfolios. But are you making assumptions that are different for ERCOT in different scenarios? The net zero economy scenario does have an ERCOT capacity market. So the idea there is that uh, given a, a larger overhaul and the type of resources that would be needed to meet that type of net zero push, the market would have to be somewhat redesigned and would move towards a capacity market construct. Uh, so that would result in a different set of value drivers for the ERCOT market and requirements. So that's the one where we really have a major market design change. Uh, the other scenarios are not moving away from energy only. They're not assuming okay. larger interconnection to other regions, for example. No interconnects and, and no capacity uh, additions in, uh, yeah, under the auspices of ERCOT. Other under the than other three. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's right. That's right. And are you going to leave the, uh, this is a question I had this morning and nobody answered. Are you going to leave the, um, Carbon cost in for 20 is coming in in 27 in the nominal case. We are, um, you know, it, it would be a fairly significant rework to. Redo that, you know, that could be looked at at a later point. Uh, I think it's a modest carbon price. I, I heard you this morning. Modest, but I agree. It, it, impacts, it impacts the cases, particularly on the carbon. And on it the does. It, it does, um, and you know we have two out of the four cases don't have a carbon price, um, so you know there's going to be some data there that we can look at, and I think it's still plausible that over the long term there could be carbon pressure again beyond the IRA. I, I hear your point about you know this being a policy that's come forward with a bunch of carrots, and we don't expect maybe a stick in the near term, but right. I think it's still valid to. To say that post 2030, for example, you could get some carbon pricing. So that that's the plan that we're sticking on at the moment. Primarily because it's in the model now. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. All the runs have been completed with that. Yep. That's unfortunate. Okay, who's next? Anyone? This is your chance. Need to, can I close out that question based on what you just shared and, and pass? Is this, uh, is, Peter, is this Peter? I'm sorry. Yes, I, wanted, okay, I was trying to ahead. chime in, but I was on mute. Uh, just to close that out, thank you, Pat, for that detailed uh, explanation, and thank you, Reed, for clarifying uh, what I was trying to to get at. Um, just, I guess, in hindsight, if it's not uh, water under the bridge yet, I, I would I would offer for a recommendation that you consider the volatile market scenario uh, and, and the net zero possibly, but the market, the, the volatile, it seems to me that's where we're living right now and that's the most extreme. And again, what you shared about the net zero kind of makes sense regarding the um, the capacity market being incorporated. So that those are my, my recommendations on, on uh, the explanation. But thank you for all the feedback. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know. Stall around here, see if there's any more questions, comments, complaints, concerns. Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you very much for your time and attention. Hey, Reed, uh, what? One, okay. one, uh, yeah, not, not a question, but a comment in general. Uh, again, uh, to all, if you, you know, this was one session where we, uh, you know, we were available to answer questions, but it, it, you know, subsequently, if there are any questions that you have, please feel free to forward them through and to, uh, to us and we will, uh, you know, uh, do our best to explain and answer those questions, you know, uh, to help, uh, you know, address any concerns that you might have. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh. I'll uh, appreciate everybody's uh, tuning in and uh, thank you. We'll uh, adjourn the meeting at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.